أناجي الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى أناجي الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum And welcome to another edition of Perspective My name is Faisal Patel The Turkish 7th High Criminal Court in Istanbul in Turkey has issued warrants of arrests against four Israeli commanders from the Israeli Navy and Israeli Defense Force or IDF Now this follows a four-year-long case involving South African journalist Khadija Davids, who was on board the Mavi Mamara, a humanitarian aid flotilla which was attempting to break the Israeli siege on the Gaza Strip on the 31st of May 2010. Now, according to Davids, the IDF surrounded the boat, which was in international waters at the time, and killed 10 civilians on board while detaining and injuring hundreds of others, including dozens of journalists. Davids says she was held against the will in an Israeli prison, assaulted, interrogated, and denied consular access and legal representation. She laid her first complaint against the commanders of the South African Police Services and National Prosecuting Authority, or NPA, in January 2011. She says the decision by the Turkish authorities to issue the warrants will hold the Israeli commanders responsible to answer for crimes that were committed in the high seas. Now, this important decision will reverberate across Turkey and amongst many other jurisdictions like the UK, Spain, Greece and Sweden, where citizens of such countries were also victims of this vicious and cowardly attack by the Israeli Defense Force. This is according to Khadija Davids. Now, Davids attorney Ziad Patel says the warrant of arrests sets an important precedent for the utilization of South Africa's ratification of the Rome Statute. He says it has massive implications as it is one of the first in the country's history where South African authorities have undertaken enforcement proceedings arising from codified principles of universal jurisdiction in order for this case to proceed in cooperation with the case unfolding in Turkey as a result of the Rome Statute. Now the Hawks have confirmed they've received a letter from Turkish authorities asking that they arrest these four commanders and their names are Gabriel Ashkenazi, Eliza Marom, Avishay Levi and Amos Yedlin from the Israeli Navy and IDF if they enter South Africa or they set foot in South Africa. Now, there was a briefing on Tuesday at Constitutional Hill regarding the warrant of arrests and details of the attack. ITV was there. Let's have a look and see what happened. In the name of God, merciful to all and compassionate to each, I welcome each and every one of you to this momentous press briefing to declare three things. The first is victory, victory over an apartheid Zionist colonizer whose military has been brought to its knees by a single individual's courage, 786 journalist Khadija Davids. The second is the impact of the legal decision in terms of holding accountable Israel Despite its numerous wars, we have seen a lack of accountability. And I believe that this judgment changes the tide against the occupier state of Israel. But more importantly, I think we are all here today to listen to a survivor's story. Khadija Davids was on board the Mavi Mamara on that fateful evening of the 31st of May of 2010. She was on board with colleagues and friends, and 10 of whom were martyred. Today, we hear her story, and we hear the story of a survivor's victory. And Khadija, today, 
ensures that the Palestinian people's narrative, those that were martyred on the Mavi Mamara, and those that were subjected to Israeli brutality, that their voices will never be silenced. And she continues to do the excellent work that she does through her occupation at Radio 786. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Khadija Davids. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I just want to say shukran and thank you uh, for the support I received um, from my family, my friends, my colleagues at 786, uh, the Media Review Network, and also uh, to Ziad and the, Media, the Muslim Lawyers Association for their support and uh, giving me the means to seek justice. Um, a lot has been said since 2010, since the attack, um, and now with the recent media attention about what I experienced um, on those few days on the boat and in the Israeli prison. But I just wanted to take you guys through, through some of the other kind of niggly tactics that the Israelis would use um, when they dealt with us. Um, on the boat itself, after the attack, and we were allowed back up onto the ship, um, they had turned off the air conditioning. So we were, <coughs> excuse me, in the middle of summer, um, on the Mediterranean Sea, no air conditioning. We had to ask for water. We had to ask to go to the bathroom. Um, and when we went to the bathroom, the suction had been switched off as well. So you were left seeing other people's feces in the toilets. And that was the kind of thing that they subjected us to. Um, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional now. Um, yeah, so the reception that we got um, in Ashdod, um, they corralled us around, you were less than human. Um, and I asked for um, consular and legal assistance. I was denied all those things. I was made to stand facing a wall in the tent while these ladies laughed at me. And then they just sent you off again. So that was just some of the kinds of things that you experience. And I felt that that was one of the experiences that Palestinians go through every day. Um, they get subjected to checkpoints regularly at any place. Israelis can decide whether you can go to hospital or not, whether you can go to school or not. And that's in all of Palestine, not just I mean, everyone focuses on Gaza, but it's in all of Palestine. So it was just, it reaffirmed my, when you report on Palestine, you just hear people's voices, you hear, you see pictures, but you kind of get desensitized to that because it's on a TV, it's someone's detached voice, but seeing it for yourself and experiencing it for yourself, that for me reaffirmed um, my move to or, or what I would do in order to create awareness around what the Israelis are doing in Palestine. So this decision um, by the South African authorities and through the hard work of Ziad and everyone else at the Muslim Lawyers Association has given us an opportunity to, as my mother said, close, tighten the net around the Israelis and um, restrict their movements even further because they've been doing it for far too long in Palestine. Thank you. <laughs> The other aspect that is crucial within this matter, I believe, is the legal victory. And now I hand over to our legal expert, attorney Ziad Patel, and he will walk us through the tedious journey, the tedious legal journey that we've taken. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good morning to everyone that has come to this press conference. Indeed, it's a decision of a decision that is extremely significant that has come out of the South African police services. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Khadija for the support that she has shown in me, for the courage and the uh, determination for me to be able to handle this case. I'd also like to make mention of the Muslim Lawyers Association, Advocate Shabnam Mayat, Advocate Firoz Bauda, Attorney Yusha Tayyab, 
all members of the Muslim Lawyers Association who is part of the legal team and have assisted me in this journey and getting to the point where we are, where this decision was now, uh, where this decision was now given. I'd also like to thank the Media Review Network, the Palestine Solidarity Alliance, BDS South Africa, and every other solidarity movement, any other Palestine solidarity movement that has played a role in this amazing victory. In order to understand the case of the Marvi Marmara, one has to go back to the December-January period of 2008-2009, when Operation Cast Lead had been started by, this, uh, by the Israeli Defense Force. We're all aware of Operation Cast Lead and its impact. I'd like to make reference to, United, to the United Nations report of 25th, 25th September 2009 on the Gaza conflict. The United Nations mission report holds the view that Israel continues to be duty-bound under the Fourth Geneva Convention and to the full extent of the means available to it to ensure the supply of foodstuff, medical and hospital items and other goods, goods to meet the humanitarian needs of the population of the Gaza Strip without qualification. And that is contained in the United Nations fact-finding mission report. Further down, paragraph 1886, what makes the application and assessment of proportionality difficult in respect of many of the events investigated by the mission is that deeds by the Israeli armed forces in words of military and political leaders prior to and during the operations indicate that as a whole, they were premised on a deliberate policy of disproportionate force aimed not at the enemy, but at the supporting infrastructure in practice, this appears to have meant the civilian population. And this paragraph really stood out for me in terms of the fact-finding mission report. And just listen to this carefully, because this is the story of the Mavi Mamra. The timing of the first Israeli attack at 11.30 a.m. on a weekday, when children were returning from school and the streets of Gaza were crowded, with people going about their daily business appears to have been calculated to create the greatest disruption and widespread panic amongst the civilian population. The treatment of many civilians detained or even killed while trying to surrender is one manifestation of the way in which the effective rules of engagement, standard operating procedures and instructions to the troops on the ground appear to have been framed in order to create an environment in which due regard for civilian lives and basic human dignity was, this, was replaced with disregard for basic international humanitarian law and human rights norms. This is a United Nations fact-finding mission report that stated the IDF started its campaign at 11.30 a.m. when Gaza streets were full of children. Coming out of the United Nations, of course, the emotions are high. Of course, people want to be on a ship. Of course, people want to deliver essential humanitarian aid. And this was the beginning of the Gaza Aid Flotilla mission. <laughs> The United Nations report dated 27 September 2010 on the flotilla attack. The fact-finding mission concluded that a series of violations of international law, including international humanitarian and human rights law, were committed by the Israeli forces during the interception of the flotilla and during the detention of passengers of Israel prior to deportation. Khadija is a survivor. She was deported. She will tell her real story to journalists on a one-to-one -one basis. What is the human story behind this? The human story behind this is the Palestinian solidarity that South Africans have shown. Khadija as a journalist aboard the Mavi, covering an amazing journey, a journey 
that was uncertain of whether it would actually reach the borders of Gaza. It's a story of solidarity between South Africa and Turkey. As we know, 10 Turkish citizens lost their lives in this violent and gruesome attack by the IDF on that fateful morning. Let's get to the story before we get to the decision. This is the story of the Turkish victims that were aboard the Mavi. This is the story of the many, many human rights people, many captains, ordinary seamen, medical staff, journalists, all with one purpose, to break the siege of Gaza. This is their story. Khadija is a reflection of that story. An attorney that was aboard the Mavi Mamara and extremely involved in the case that has been brought in the Istanbul Criminal High Court provided me with a statement. And I would like to take the opportunity of reading the statement to tell the stories of the Turkish victims that lost their lives before we get to the decision. One of the victims, Sengiz Songur, he was born in June 1963 in Hosanlia village of the Bezer district, Konya. He started to work after primary school. He was living in Azmir, married to Ms. Nurkan and the father of six children whose names are. He was in the fleet to help with the technical and mechanical reparations. He noticed the letter in his pocket after boarding the ship. The letter put in his pocket by one of his daughters was saying, I am scared, father, seeing the sorrow in the eyes of my brother and sisters, and the concern in my mother's face makes me scared. Yet you should go, father, even if it means losing you in the end. Go to make an orphan smile for the prayer of a mother. Go even if the only thing that would return to us would be your name. According to the Istanbul Institution of Forensic Medicine and the UN Human Rights Council report, Sengir Songuz, 47 years old, was shot on the bridge deck before the door opening to the main stairs during the air to ground fire. He was hit by a single bullet right below the neck, upper middle chest area. It has been seen that the bullet broke his left rib and entered the chest cavity and stuck into the back area after injuring the aorta and the right atrium. Although the doctors on the ship tried to save him by cardiac massage, their efforts were fruitless. The story of one victim. Let's tell the story of another victim. Sechin Tobluku. He was a working volunteer in Adana Humanitarian Relief Association and was especially taking part in organizations aimed to help orphans, carrying out activities for youngsters at Education, Culture and Youth Commission. Setin was married to Ms. Sikhdam and had a son named Aitak. He participated in the Open Road Open Road to Palestine organization in 2009 before joining the fleet. He joined as an educator and a first aid specialist. According to the Istanbul Institution of Forensic Medicine Autopsy Report and Human Rights Council Report, Setin was shot in close proximity to the door on the bridge deck while trying to help bring in the injured passengers. He was shot by three bullets. One bullet hit on the right side of his head and pierced him just above the soft tissue and punctured his skull and came out from the right side of the neck. The same bullet pierced through the back of the right shoulder and stuck on the chest. The second bullet pierced through the left hip and struck at the right pelvis. The third bullet pierced through the right groin and came out from the back. It is thought that the victim was in a crouched or bent position when he had his wound. His wife was right next to him at the time of death. His wife, a widow, I met her last week in Istanbul, still traumatized, still seeking justice, still trying to make sense of this violent and gruesome attack by the Israeli Defense Force. This was a humanitarian aid mission, and I urge the media in this country to focus on the stories of the victims and I urge the media in this country to focus on the purpose of the mission. There are stories behind this. 
There are at least 10 stories. There were many, many victims. Khadija was our victim. She was a victim from South Africa. But there were many victims with gunshot wounds, assaulted, persecuted, kidnapped, held without permission, detained, denied consular access. This constitutional court, in a court judgment of 2014, stated a Latin maxim, a Latin maxim hostis humani generis. It means, like the pirate, the torturer is an enemy of all humankind. What has the IDF represented to us? They have tortured victims, they have acted and committed piracy on the high seas, they did not seek the permission of any of the, any of the, of the people aboard. They redirected an entire flotilla of ships to the port of Ashdod. Khadija will tell you her story. And once again, I would like to thank everyone that has attended this press conference today. And most of all, I'd like to thank Khadija for her bravery and her courage and with her mom next to her on this momentous and victorious occasion. Thank you very much. In light of that, I would like to open the platform for Khadija's mom just to say a few words. As a mother of the survivor of the horrors of the Mavi Mamra, and also as a mother of justice. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning. I'm, I'm really humbled. Um, also, uh, thank you so much for welcoming us so warmly to Johannesburg and to be here at this amazing, well, in this amazing building of so many memories of women, of st struggle and fighting for justice. So, I start in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Just allow me to say thank you uh, on behalf of my family and the Islamic Unity Convention, which is the license holder of Radio 786. Uh, we truly um, express here today our sincere gratitude and thanks to Muslim Lawyers Association as well as the Muslim uh, the Media Review Network for all your efforts to keep the Zionist State of Israel accountable for the continuous war crimes on humanity. And of course, in this case, we we looking at the Mami Marmara and all those who were directly affected by this traumatic experience. And once again, I just want to thank each and every one, all the attorneys, the advocates, the legal teams. I know it's hard work. And I thank you from the bottom, from my heart as well as I'm speaking here on behalf of my family as well. Thank you for the funders. And it's just again also if we can, as justice loving people, can pool our resources, whether it's skills or, or monetary um, contributions to bring about social justice, then so be it. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you so much for this occasion here in this amazing building, we are just sort of saying that the struggle for justice continues. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you one and all for being present here today. Thank you to Khadija, her mom, her radio station 786, the Muslim Lawyers Association, PSA, MRN, BDSSA, and many other organizations that have supported all along this path. Thank you one and all. Have a safe journey and take care. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of another edition of Perspective for this week. Join me again next week, inshallah, where we cover stories making local, national, and international headlines. Remember, you can interact with me by sending me a mail on Faisal at itvnetworks.tv. Drop me a tweet on at Faisi143, or you can even comment on facebook.com forward slash Faisal Patel. From myself, Faisal Patel, and the magnificent team here at ITV, Fia Manila, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> لهي من 
أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى إلهي صرت في ظرف عصيب فاكشف البنوى فيا ربي أنا عبد لرد الطيب لا يقوى أعني